Every day I'm trying to convince one person that life is a billion times better than they've decided because they were unfortunate to have life situations or most common, cynical or pessimistic or negative parents and circumstances that made them believe the propaganda of negativity. Vayner Nation, I'm extremely excited about this episode of the podcast because this is a gentleman that I've started to get to know a little bit but have admired from afar quite a bit, not only because of the company he built and in the category he built it in and navigated it, but you know, I, I really do enjoy getting to know people through shared relationships and I've just always liked the way people have spoken about Daniel behind his back, especially people I know that know what I care about, which is like, look, there's a lot of good entrepreneurs out there. A lot of people have built nice businesses and big businesses, and but I just kind of like nice people and things of that nature and so it's a really not pay a lot of money to get there Gary like it's been a lot of bribes to uh, get them to say those nice things behind it's you. true that sentence probably I made at least thirty seven thousand dollars on um, it's a uh, no really my friend it's really nice to have you here I always like to give the guests the first two minutes to paint a picture of context to the audience so you know, both personally or professionally or anywhere you want to take it, Daniel, why don't you tell everybody who you are um, and a little bit about yourself and your journey. Thank you, Gary. I'm very pleased also to be with you. I've been also hearing your name for so many years and I was too slow to connect with you because obviously you've just uh, done an incredible job and I just only wish we had uh, started working with you many years ago. Well, listen, we got 40, 50, 60 more years together, my friend, so unofficially, officially. When did you start on this journey as like the social media maven? I wrote a book in 2009 called Crush It that made an argument that YouTube and Twitter would create a micro economy where people could make $100,000 a year really being themselves or talking about their deep niches. And as you remember, much like what may start happening here, the economy was in a very tricky spot after the crisis. And my argument was, hey, this internet thing, this social media thing is much, much, much bigger than people think. And A, for you individual human, there might be some opportunity, but B, for every business and brand, this is the parallel of what happened when the radio lost its leverage to the television. I believe that social is gonna eat up a lot of the marketing realities. And you know, a lot of people didn't believe me and a lot of people thought it was, you know, I mean, there's not a single, You could type in right now, Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, Instagram, and just put a fad, and you'll read a thousand articles of Facebook's a fad, YouTube's a fad, Twitter's a fad, the internet is a fad. You remember, you and I were going through those years. So, you know, I think I I had a lot of conviction and was quite loud about a lot of things that ended up being true that people didn't think was true. Even more recently, TikTok, four years ago, I'm like the Pied Piper on LinkedIn and every other platform that TikTok's real, real, real. People thought it was a platform for teenage girls dancing. And so I think, you know, the receipts, as my favorite football head coach, Robert Sala, talks about, the receipts over the last decade, I think, have given me that opportunity. I think I've been hearing your name even before then, but yeah, certainly, certainly from that moment. Anyway, um, you wanted to just share a little bit about Yeah, I think, I think people will really enjoy, you know, the context of who you are, and then we'll go into a series of modern questions. Sure, so I'm best known as the founder of Kind, a healthy snack company. I started from nothing and uh, built it into a pretty significant company. But I, uh, and I was at every stage of the game from inception when I was a one person operation of the company that launched Kind all the way to what it is today. But I actually don't identify myself as the big guy from Kind. I identify myself as the guy that was carrying the boxes even before Kind was found, PeaceWorks and as a social entrepreneur. PeaceWorks is a company that promotes peace through business, that brings neighbors in conflict regions to work together and use business as a force for bringing Israelis, Palestinians, Egyptians, Turks, Jordanians together. We have ventures in Indonesia and Sri Lanka, in South Africa and Mexico. Lots of mistakes, lots of lessons from which Kind sprung and drew the lessons and then had a success. I built a lot of uh, civic platforms. I co-founded a movement called One Voice, which gave birth to the largest uh, civic movement in existence today in both uh, within Israeli and Palestinian societies. 
and most recently I've been very involved in the United States in both building bridges but also like helping amplify the voices of moderation and recognize the dangers that all of us have if we allow extremism and for unforgiving judgmentalism and meanness to well, polarize and destroy our society. So that moderation, what I call purple, in a world of everybody trying to be more red and blue, purple. Not just that, but even if you're red or if you're blue, for you to not think that the red or the blue are evil, and also to help to have the courage to work across lines of difference and yep. to better understand them, not because you're gonna give up your values or concede, but because by understanding you have a chance of creating concrete progress uh, and there's like we just did a survey Gary where 87 percent of Americans are fed up with the polarization yeah. and feel like yeah. really really yeah, it's tense yeah extremism is uh, eclipsing it's a it's a more. yeah it's because you know rubber neck you know when everything's fine on the highway you're not paying attention to anybody else but when there's an accident everybody's rubbernecking you know it's funny one of the big mantras within my own company, I talk a lot about is and versus or. And that's what you're referring to, which is like, it just doesn't have to be that way. The world is not that small. The world is so big. You know, you know the, there's a lot of entrepreneurs that. That's one of the chapters in my book. I wrote a book called Do the Kind of Thing and the organizing principles of a thinking with and rather than with or. I love that. I mean, it makes so much sense why you had the success. Some of stuff that I see from you in content and I'm not, uh, uh, like I love, we are like like-minded souls, and I hope we don't make it boring. I hope you ask me tough questions. Well, here, here's a here's a here's a tough question. Let's 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 not make it boring. I realized three four years ago that the kryptonite in my unstoppable force of you know human skills was candor, which blew myself. And as I started talking about it, people that consume my content away because Gary V is very good at candor, because I'm speaking to the world, I'm not having a one-on-one conversation. Gary Vaynerchuk, the executive, really struggled with candor, because I like optimism and happiness so much, and I was so capable that I wasn't able to deliver candor, because I thought it would lead to fear, and then, and what it ended up leading to was more fear, because people didn't know where they stood. And that was a very sombering moment in my career. So back to not softball questions. If I asked you, you've had this incredibly strong career, Uh, You clearly care about humanity and you're a professional juggernaut. If I asked you professionally what the biggest vulnerability you have now in hindsight, what you struggled with, maybe you've gotten better, maybe you're going through your process of getting better right now, just being very transparent, naked, naked. And I think it's, first of all, it's somewhat related to yours, but mine would probably be accountability because I'm very good at setting out vision, I'm very good at getting people engaged, I'm actually very good at candor with kindness, and I would like to actually talk about that, because I thought that's what you were gonna go, it's a really yep. good insight with you. Thank you. I have a couple of thoughts on that. Please. But mine is uh, following through with my team and holding all of us accountable. I just, my approach is like aim for the stars, and I actually, if we don't land there, we land here, we'll just do, give it our very, very best. Right. And that to a degree good, but like Ellie Lanning, who's my uh, partner in uh, Equilibra Ventures and in a lot of the work we do, and she used to be my most important team members at Kind, she, she's much more about tracking ourselves and holding ourselves accountable. I think that's an area where I have a big opportunity. Do you, can I, can, I, can I double click into that? Because I think we're, yeah. we are very like-minded. Do you believe, because this is a nuanced one for some of the people listening. Do you believe that there's a nuance there that might, I think might be a huge insight because a lot of entrepreneurs are gonna listen to this, especially over the next 50 years. Do you believe that in that, it's because you're being so creative and so ambitious, because I always say it all the time too, let's shoot for the moon and if we end up on the top of Mount Everest, we did well, it's better than being here on the floor. Do you believe that has something to do with lots of objectives at the same time? So when I hear you talk about holding people accountable, I have a similar thing, but it's because I know that I'm asking people to do 47 things and I know that 29 are gonna be really damn good, eight are gonna be solid and 10 are probably not gonna go anywhere. Do you feel like subconsciously or even in the way I'm asking you this question, if you're reflecting really quick, that there was maybe something in there as well or no? 
I think it's fundamentally because you and I are entrepreneurs rather than business managers. Correct. So, you know, there's a difference between being an inventor, an entrepreneur, a business manager. An inventor has enormous amount of creativity, but no execution power. They come up with great ideas, but they don't Correct. have the ability to see them building. A business manager has an incredible talent at getting things done, but they don't have the left side of the brain as developed. An entrepreneur has a balance between those. An entrepreneur will never be as good as an inventor or as a business manager at that specific thing, but they're really good at the balance of them. And for it to work for an entrepreneur, you do need a ton of creative ideas. You need to try things and fail and be okay with it. And I think we're good at trying things out, encouraging our team to try things out. And we're okay with failure. We're okay with, but it's not always so easy. Like my temperament and my approach worked really well most times at Kind. But sometimes, like when Kind was double digit growing and triple digit growing every year for, I'm sorry, triple digits. We're growing over 100% <laughs> for 10 years in a row. And so we're always exceeding goals. My goal, my approach was totally fine. But when we aimed to grow triple digits and all of a sudden we only grew 89% or we wanted to grow 80% and we grow 30% or anything like yeah. that, to some of my team members, it was very demotivating that they didn't hit their goals. And I'm like, who cares? Why mm. you can't count? Let's just focus on putting in the best work in. And, and yep. it's in some situations, it can get us into trouble. Makes sense. In two or three years in a row, you don't meet your goals. To certain team members, it can be demotivating. Yes. And forget about the fact that what I would do then is because people were very working very high and we still were growing like crazy, just not what yes. we thought we'd grow. I would still pay people their full bonuses, so, so it wouldn't be about that. But it's not about that. It's people that are competitive, they want to meet their goals, they want to feel good about it. But did they not understand that the goals were completely subjective? I think you have that, a different personality from many people, and in certain people and organizations, sales organizations, and, and, and I used to have this debate with, with one of my friends that was sales driven, say, well, why are we aiming so low? Is that you think these people that you've hired that are so high driven are gonna stop if they get the goal. Set the right goal, don't, uh, yep. uh, how do you call it? Uh, sandbag it. Don't sandbag it. Uh, <laughs> I always forget, don't sandbag it. I need to uh, research <laughs> the sandbags <laughs> origin. I'm working with your team, Gary, on this series that's really funny where we call my, when I come up with really dumb things, uh, earlier today, I said, we need to roll in the sleeves of the what? It was rolling up the Well, it's, it's so funny, it's not dumb, and I wanna take the word dumb out, I'll tell you why. I was no, born, just being I know you are, I know you are, but I want everybody fun. to hear it. It's really funny, I can't believe you're, this is gonna be a fun, this is so fun. My family, obviously I was born in Belarus. And so when you just said that, it's, there's maybe nothing, I got warm. When you just said, the, what you, when you just said a saying slightly different than it is in English because you, it's not your first language, you, I wish technology was in a place where I could press a button and show everybody how warm that sentence just made me feel, which is why I'm jumping in. My family had, through the years, has so many fun moments with each other because my parents, even I, even I, uh, have some fun, I say things that aren't actually right, but they become ours. I remember my favorite one was, my mom and my aunt kept talking about sauce. They're like, get the sauce, get the sauce. And the, at a certain point I was old enough where they would ask me to get it. And they're like, go get the sauce. And I would like open the refrigerator and looking for like sauce. And my mom be like, no, sauce, sauce. And I never knew what it meant and then finally there was this moment where, cause I'd usually just go run and play but then finally my mom did it in front of me, she opened up the drawer and it was SOS, the thing that like clear, cleans and like me and my sister and so like I'm sure all the immigrants would have a big smile right now were because- Were you born in the US or you also were born in Belarus? I was born in Belarus. Yeah but you have no accent, how- I was, how I was three, you? that's why I don't have an accent. I was three but as Anything, you- But when we were talking about this I think um, you want to have also for our audience an ADHD person where we're going so many different directions. And for some people setting very clear goals and of course. To meet them, it's very, very important for A hundred percent. My belief is that putting players in a position to succeed and reverse engineering themselves, them, not how we are, absolutely. On the flip side, and I'm sure you have a lot of pride in this, some of the greatest enjoyment in my life today, professionally, sits in taking people that were that 
type A and seeing that eight years later, some of me has rubbed off on them on osmosis and I'll tell you where the joy comes from and I'm sh- I have a funny feeling you're gonna resonate with this and this is for all the leaders listening to where some of the benefits can come from. A lot of times it's eliminated a lot of anxiety for a lot of those people. I get a lot of pride walking around and being, and I look at people, there's one sitting right outside of me right now, I'm like, she's less anxious today than she was seven years ago because she was too black and white and she's fallen a little in love with gray and I love that through my years I've gotten a little more black and white back to your point and, and that's kind of the game. Yeah, what I, what I love from what you said is when my team members tell me that they accomplish far more than they ever thought was possible yeah. because I challenge them and yes. I do. People think that because, and I'm gonna go back to your candor thing. Please. People think that because you're kind, a lot of people equate it with weakness and they equate kindness with niceness. And the culture we created a kind, our company, and the approach that I have in life is to clarify that there's a big difference between being nice and being kind. To be nice, you are polite. You don't need strength. You can you, you can be a nice person. It's not a bad thing, but you don't need to have the strength of kindness. To be kind, you need to be honest. And to be honest, you need that candor that you're talking about. That requires a lot of strength. Like if somebody has something in their tooth and you meet them in a party, if you're nice, you don't tell them you want to make them feel uncomfortable. But if you're kind, you invade their space and say, you have something here. And that takes strength, but guess what? You actually help them more. And so providing feedback feedback and being candid in your job and creating that yes. earned debate environment is essential, but you do it with, you know, what we at Kind calls hungry and kind values. I, I, I love the that. With the tender of authenticity and yeah, toughness it's and earnest debate without needing yeah, to hurt a person. That's absolutely people. right. I love that. Daniel, for more fun to put teeth into this interview, in the last 10, 15 years in popular business culture, that's how I'll frame it, so hopefully I'll get you there. What do you think you were most wrong about with consumers? Because I think you have a great strength with it. So if something that's working today that you just didn't see coming, never would have believed, moved your organizations or your investments or your behaviors against it, but it became true with the consumer. If, if I said that question, which company, I mean, I, maybe a company that was wildly successful that you thought had no yeah. chance, anything there, stand up? All, there are two or three different things that came to mind from, so I'll try yeah. them all. Yeah, please. One was just in terms of cultures, it's really, really funny, but this is almost like now become so, everybody knows this, but in January of 2020, mm. we required everybody to be in the office five days a week. And I remember my prior president, John Leahy, one of my best friends and mentors, used to really insist that we couldn't even give them Fridays off mm. to work from home. Because a lot of people in the New York mm. Tristan area had three hour commutes each mm-hmm. way. So some people are like, can we work out of home on Fridays? And John was like, no, hands, all hands on deck. We all need to be here and feel, feel it, the it. osmosis. Our culture. Yes. Today, many people work out of their homes. Maybe people come into their office two or three days a week. Maybe, sometimes they don't even go as much. And it's a very high performing culture. Everybody's proven that, that, it, that we had it wrong about that. So in terms of culturally, yeah. that function was completely. Yeah. In terms of trends, I have so many stories of like the way I created kind is because I looked for something that I needed. Like a health you reverse product. engineered yourself. Right. So I tend to approach uh, consumer product, good opportunities and investments, think if it fits me, but I've missed a ton of them as a result, like many of them. Like somebody approached me with the idea to create an oat based beverage 10, 15 years ago <laughs> and I'm like, why would anybody want to take oats and turn it into a beverage? How stupid can I get? <laughs> and now I drink oat milk all the time. Yeah, yeah. And my friends uh, invested in that company, and, and but it's a whole industry right now. There's so yes. many companies in that space, and it's a billion dollar space. Yes. And I didn't see it. And I can give you ten more examples where I I didn't see uh, things that have a place to say. I, I'm I'm fine with. Ignoring fads in your industry, the, uh, those the technology that the happens all the like, time. For me, the these special diets that are like going to last for three months, I I don't 
feel like we've lost anything by avoiding those. But there are sustainable uh, Trends. solutions that I did not see and, and they were very effective. In your childhood, did you know that you were an entrepreneur? Yes, yes. Why? I was, I was well, Why? I didn't know that I was an entrepreneur. I just love entrepreneurship. Right, I right, right. Entrepreneur without even understanding. Right, you know, right, right. right. When I was eight years old, my father was an entrepreneur. My, I saw him build himself from nothing. He arrived to Mexico with nothing. He had a third grade education. He had been in a concentration camp, liberated by American soldiers, been a refugee, came to Mexico not speaking Spanish or English, building himself from nothing, educating himself from nothing. And so I had, I think, absorbed from him or watched or maybe was genetic. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, all of the above, by the way. Business. I used to do magic shows as a kid. I used to do... When I was 16 years old, I started selling watches and all sorts of tchotchkes in, uh, <laughs> in um, uh, flea markets. And oh, that's, 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 that's why all this stuff you see behind me, I was incredibly affected by that culture. I was, really? that, yes, like sports cards, flea markets, garage sales. Like if I was a generation older, I would have been a schmata monster, you know? You know, I, I need to go back to the, Flea market where I started as a 16 year old because I didn't have, my family came to America lawfully because my dad had a business, but I didn't have the right to work. So I couldn't get, all my friends were taking How old were jobs you? with waiters and waitresses and I got lucky that I couldn't get that. So I created my own. So I started selling these things. Eventually I was selling at kiosks in shopping malls and I had all my college students helping. Uh, in, I love that. Provide all, all the scheduling and work, you know, where I have like 10 team members. How old were you when you came? 15 and a half. And that was to where in America? To the cradle of civilization, San Antonio, Texas. <laughs> That's amazing, amazing. You know, I, I joke about it because I was, I loved coming to America, I love the United States. I mean, with all of its failings, I think it's the most amazing country on earth. Sure. I think it was like I contrasted to my father's experience. Of my course. Experience, so, uh, uh, but when we came to San Antonio, if you were late three days, if you had three tardies, they would give you licks. Then they would take this big stick and they would bend really down and hit you. Yeah, this was in 1984. So it was like, whoa, you know, this is the land. <laughs> the cradles is this. San Antonio <laughs> wasn't fucking around in '84, huh? They weren't <laughs> and uh, but you know when they're that was a public was school like, or was that a like a religious school? school? A public school. Robert E. Lee High School. Wow, Robert E. Lee. You have to get, you have to get a, a, a permission from your parents. But the alternative was that you were gonna be in a study hall with ax murderers. So <laughs> I'm like, let me get those three licks because I don't wanna be- Right, right. With them. That's amazing. Um, but you asked earlier about something that I didn't see coming, Gary, and to speak a little seriously, when I immigrated to America, to the land of opportunity, to the land of freedom, yep. to the land of bipartisan respect. Yep. I it never crossed my mind that I would end up being as worried as I am about our country as I am today. Yeah. I end up applying my, my, my parents my parents my parents talk about the same thing. They're like never thought they would worry about the things they have to worry about now. Yeah, and I used to apply my efforts for build bridging in the Middle East and yep. in other parts of the world. And now I feel like we really need to build the toolkit of values and yep. Uh, daily habits. Well, you know, you know, we talked about it earlier, my friend. I'm sorry to jump in, but I want to get your perspective on this, and I don't want to run out of time because we're wrapping up. Um, we've lost the art of civility. You know, I think about that a lot. Watching grown-ups interact with each other around politics, and the politicians themselves, was like unacceptable by fifth graders when I was growing up. Yeah. Like I'm, I'm watching the name calling, and I'm like. Of course, like, where are, like, wh where have we, how have we gotten here? And, you know, look, I think there's a million variables that get one to somewhere, but like, you know, yeah, I mean, I think a lot of us, back to your 87% are unhappy. Like, even my most stark, fully left, fully right friends, and I have plenty of both, because I'm a very purple guy, even I can sense in them, and I'm talking the ones that have been the loudest to get us into the far left and the far right, even with them, I'm noticing, I'm, on October 27th of an election, midterm election year, 
the fatigue I sense from far left and far right actually has me optimistic a little bit because it's fucking hard to fight. It takes a lot of energy to hate. In a way, because what, what makes us a great country, what makes us the most entrepreneurial nation with the most freedom, there's an underlying oil that glue that kills the yes. machine running. Yes. And it's kindness, it's respect, it's civility, as you were saying. If you do not have kindness, respect, and civility, you lose the effectiveness in your working environment. You don't have a high-performing culture because you cannot be candid because you feel like you're going to be canceled and you're going to be destroyed so then you're like holding back in the yeah. classroom or in the mm-hmm. college or in the workplace if you don't have the ability to create transparency earnestness uh candor uh trust openness in that it requires that you yeah, know that nuance 100 percent you don't have that positive intent it, it it will destroy all of us it will destroy not just our of society course. but our economy and what the solution is, I, I help co-found a movement called Starts With Us. Starts With Us. Starts With Us, that everybody should join because if you're up and you don't know what to do about it, go look at startswith.us. There's a ton of things that you can do to help us build a movement for the 87%. The 87% that recognize that both for us to be better parents, better children, more effective in our workplace and more effective citizens, we need to work with the three Cs more curiosity, more compassion, and more courage. Curiosity to respect that we don't have all the answers, yep. that other people may have insights that we may not know, that we need to more be more critical thinkers and critical listeners. Compassion to just put ourselves in other people's shoes and just be a little bit more forgiving, a little bit less judgmental, and the courage to work across lines of difference. And that's, you know, echo chambers on social media, cable news polarization, divisive politicians, these are the perfect storm to create a lot of bad habits. But the solution is, like you said, Gary, more than 87% of Americans are fed up, and it's up to all of us every single day to work a little bit at a time on showing those daily habits. And if we do, we are gonna bring our country back to incredible changes, but, but we really all need to take hold of it. We cannot wait for somebody else to do it for us. I couldn't agree more. Tell me a story early on from a mentor or a consumer. One of the two. In the first 10, you know, maybe a, in a, like a famous Daniel story at the flea market, you know, in San Antonio, or a consumer story, or a, a mentor, or as you were segueing at 27, you, meet, you met X. Give me a, a, a story that you think shaped you being in this place today that's outside of your family, outside of your dad, outside of your DNA and your upbringing? God, Gary, that's a great question. I have like a thousand in my mind. I'll try, I'll try to do one that's actually not in business, but it's the one that came the most over me. Um, when I was just uh, before we launched the Kind Brand, uh, I, I'd love to tell you this other story also, but please do both. When I was when I was doing peace works to bring people together, and we were trying to get Israelis and Palestinians to work together, and all of a sudden there was a spate of bombings and terrorist attacks where there was this uh, Passover massacre where a lot of Jewish families were killed, and in parallel I had a lot of Palestinian friends that were suffering enormously from the occupation. You were just seeing so much suffering. And in the meantime, I was like trying to get Palestinians and Israelis to work together. And I approached my Israeli and Palestinian friends because I felt shame, embarrassed that I was doing this. I felt like I was living a lie. And I talked to my Israeli and Palestinian friends and I said to my suppliers, I said, look guys, maybe we should put a pause on this because I know this was based on my college thesis and my law school work and we're bringing people together. But when you look at reality, it takes one extremist, one violent extremists to blow up people and really derail everything. And maybe maybe we should not be encouraging this work and maybe we're, we don't have the legitimacy to be pursuing this at this time. And my Israeli and Palestinian partners were furious at me. And there's like, Daniel, what are you talking about? This is no longer a college thesis and an intellectual uh, study. This is our lives. Are you going to abandon us now because one person does something crazy? This is... All the more so we need to double down and, yep. and not give up and not allow voices of extremism to hijack the process and rule our lives. 
we need to double down and never give up. And it was like a wake up call to where I've gone for the last, I don't know, 25, 30 years since then, because it made me realize the danger of allowing extremism to rule our lives. Because the problem, Gary, is that even if we have 87% of people that are moderate and have a purple or nuanced thought, and they certainly don't want to dehumanize the other, and that includes blue and red. You know of course, mean? of course. Blue, red, and independent, progressive and conservative, but they're people that are humans. And it's a very, very tiny, probably things less than 10% that are like so extremist. The problem is that mo- extremists wake up in the morning and they think, how can I advance my cause? That's right. And moderates wake up in the morning and they think, what can I have for breakfast? And that's a fundamental difference. Like you it's, have it's the biggest. It's the population wanting to yeah, just drink. It's nice it's breakfast. it's the biggest reason that I think people that are happy need to be louder. You just everything you just said is the single reason I make content. I think people that are happy and want others to be happy have a responsibility to also produce unlimited content. I wake up every morning and don't say, what am I gonna have for breakfast? I say, what am I gonna say this morning that's gonna get one person that's disenfranchised to realize how awesome it is to even be a human being that if they start getting rid of their grudges, grudges hurt you, not the person you have a grudge on. Every day I'm trying to convince one person that life is a billion times better than they've decided because they were unfortunate to have life situations or most common, cynical or pessimistic or negative parents and circumstances that made them believe the propaganda of negativity. And let's add that once they recognize that power that they have, they also have a responsibility to use that power because the stakes are very high for all of us. Well, the, pro- the, pro- we the, pro- the problem is people that are happy are content playing within their circle of the 50 people they're with. People that, to your point, this people that are the most unhappy right now are the loudest and the most aggressive to have misery loves company and get them in. And it's on both sides. Gary, can you tell me one fun story of any of your things in the back? There's so many fun things back there. I'll tell you one fun story. All these V friends, which is my NFT project, intellectual property, my, for 13 years, I've been building Vayner, this company. And all my smartest friends made fun of me when I started it. Because they were like, why are you doing a client service business? Like, and they came from a nice place. I was 34 at the time. They're like, you're so smart. You could build such great companies. A client, like, they were like genuinely disappointed. And I remember sitting quietly with myself and said, I'm self-aware, I know myself, and I have a hypothesis that communication's about to change. Everything we're talking about, the rails of it are internet communication, and then the vulnerabilities of mainstream media becoming businesses versus being public service providers. And so it was just very obvious to me the world was gonna change and the way Kind was gonna build its brand was going to be realistic in a world where before you had to be Procter & Gamble or Nabisco or Kraft to ever do it, that the world was changing. And I said to myself, using Star Wars, that if I build a communications Death Star, the best communications engine in the world, that anything I pointed to, your personal brand, curing Crohn's disease because my brother has it, selling a wine brand. It was agnostic. Whatever I cared about, I could point my machine against, Resi, the restaurant app, V Friends, that I could build awareness and relevance at scales that have never been seen before. And so these little characters you see, these are my characters that are like Sesame Street and Pokemon and Disney and Marvel that I'm building, right? But it was that Web3 came along and NFTs came along. I always thought that I was building this communications Death Star to buy nostalgic brands. So I thought at this point in my life, I'd be buying Smurfs or Hanna-Barbera or what Bob, Bob Iger, unfortunately, with many more resources and with the same brilliance, he moved faster with a lot more money on Marvel and Lucas. I didn't get to that. And then once he did that, more people understood their intellectual property was worth more so my master plan of like buying you know, Gumby or, or whatever it was that I was gonna buy. Anyway, it, the story is, I, is when you have a macro vision, sometimes it's not exactly how you drew it up. I was gonna build the best communications company in the world and then I was gonna act like private equity and buy intellectual property and then extract the value. Bob Iger came along and showed the world how, how underpriced 
Lucas and Marble were, and then there was micro versions of that going on. I never got to achieve it. Then a macro technology came along called the blockchain that allowed me to establish my own IP. This character, my friend, I could have bought Gumby. I could have bought Gumby, but if I bought Gumby, this character would have never existed. This, my friend, is a character. Look what this is called. Be the bigger person. We've just spent the last 40 minutes as alpha competitive winners talking about kindness and humanity. I will make this character be the bigger person, which is now a toy you could buy at Toys R Us inside of Macy's stores, so culturally relevant and popular, and that will sink into the subconscious of every child, and they will think it's cool to be the bigger person, versus the world we live in now, where people think it's cool to tear down others. I love that, but I also wanna draw for your audience uh, a thought that's actually um, a big parallel between you and I. Um, somewhere in here I have this chart that if you find it, it's almost hilarious because it has like a vision of where one, when I built PeaceWorks, it had all these different divisions that I was going to create, all different things that I was going to do, and it was like almost delusional. I mean, I had this empire of PeaceWorks and kindness, and it, it was really, if you saw it, it's, it's actually funny. But I had this vision, but where I got lucky is that I eventually learned that I needed to focus and win big in one thing before I got the right to then go elsewhere. It sounds like, and if you do that, it's not only okay for you to have a vision, it's important for you to have a vision, and then things are gonna evolve a bit different, but I think it's kind of like where we started, like dream very, very, very big, then start executing with your best intentions, and then you have one success and you can build on that and you can build on that. But the ultimate thing is that you do need that creativity, but you also need that focus for the immediate step for you to get that right, because you built the foremost firm in your space, and that gave you the right to go do the next step. I love it. My friend, this has been super enjoyable. I wish you nothing but health and continued success, really. Same here, Gary, nice to talk to you. We'll talk soon. I hope everybody enjoyed that. Please dig in. One more time, the organization, because I think a lot of people are gonna be clicking. Starts with us. And that starts with .us for all you uh, executors of URLs. Uh, Daniel, thank you again, my friend. We'll talk soon.